Hello, and welcome to the Hamumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown. I am your host, Mike Hommel. And I'm your other host, Soli Hommel. And we're going to take you through 31 scary movies through the month of October, like we do every year. But for the first time this year, we're going to do it entirely in audio format. We like to mix it up every year. One thing you need to be aware of is that we will be employing a truly ghoulish number of spoilers throughout all of these reviews. So if you haven't seen the movie we're reviewing, maybe don't listen to our podcast until you do. We highly recommend you check them out and watch along with us. It's going to be fun for everybody. I mean, how could it not be? So if you're ready and you've watched the movie, please step inside our lair and let's begin. Apartment 212 is a 2017 movie rated TVMA. Uh, we watched it on Amazon. It has a 97 minute running time and uh, IMDb gives it a 5.2. The only other score we have for it is from Rotten Tomatoes. The audience gives it a 22. So not highly rated. No, not particularly. No. So Apartment 212 is basically the story of a woman who leaves her abusive relationship, gets an apartment on her own, and promptly becomes embroiled in trouble with some kind of impish demon. You don't know it's an impish demon. I mean, spoilers, but yeah, that's that's the story. <laughs> I guess. She gets chewed on every night while she sleeps. She does. And is shockingly lackadaisical about that for a <laughs> yeah. significant portion of the movie. And everybody seems to think it's meth. I mean, I was watching it happen and knew it wasn't meth, and I still <laughs> wrote a note like... Is this meth? <laughs> I mean, it was pretty... Is this meth? <laughs> oh, no, it's a butterfly. <laughs> it imitated meth very closely. Life imitates meth. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> or something. Yeah, so you picked this movie. I Can did. Can you tell us why? I checked out the trailer for this movie, and it looked interesting. This is sort of a review spoiler, but the trailer looked more interesting than the movie did. <laughs> It, what was it about the trailer that drew you in? Well, first of, first of all, the uh, the description drew me in. It was like, you know, she it says something along the lines of she's being eaten a bite at a time every night while she sleeps and she has to, you know, get away before the last bite. I'm like, how are they going to do this? Like, is she actually going to be losing limbs? Is she going to shrink down to just her head? Well, I guess you'd be dead before that, but whatever. I mean, it's not inaccurate no. and yet quite misleading it is misleading but you know i was intrigued at that idea like what's that going to be and it's very different than any of the movies we've seen so far you know it's very body horror kind of thing Mm -hmm. and then i watched the trailer and in the trailer it's i mean it, it is kind of accurate but not really it's this mystery of where are these bites coming from and they show the doctor telling her oh those look like tooth marks and stuff like that and so there's that part and then it kind of jumps into this kind of heavy metal montage of her fighting the monster and hitting it with a baseball bat and things being flown across the room and stuff. I'm like, oh, so that's surprising that it, you know, that it it then goes to this kind of... No, what it reminds me of, and in fact it's very similar to, is one of those movies like Creepshow, there's a story about a tiki doll that comes to life in someone's apartment and goes around trying to murder them with its little tiny spear because it's like a foot (laughs) tall and its spear is like a toothpick but it's running and stabbing and it's really vicious. I don't remember this. It's kind of a comedic It sounds funny. But it's a little weird and disturbing. But it's very similar to how she was fighting this thing. Uh Uh-huh. So it sounds like the the trailer, which I did not watch, by the way. Nope. um, It sounds like the trailer basically shows all the exciting parts and neglects (laughs) to say that there will be, like, an hour of her just sleeping and then not sleeping (laughs) and thinking she has bed bugs and moving her bed clothes around from her bed to her couch to her bed to her couch and occasionally talking to her neighbor. Yeah, what what they did do to shorten that down was in the middle of this movie, there's a large montage oh, of yeah. sleeping and being upset about new sores appearing. And it's got split screen, it's got a pop love song over it for some mm-hmm. reason. Within the montage, there are even scenes where she's having a conversation I with know. her neighbor Terry, which are montaged. Like, we don't get to hear what the conversation is, we just get to see that they're talking. I felt like they made more movie and they were like ah that's not good enough let's just stick it in the montage yeah 
It's very strange. Yeah. Before we go any further, should I talk about first line, first shot? Yeah, what happened? Okay, so the movie opens on a broad daylight shot of the outside corner window of an antique shop. Like kind of looking at it with all the antique things in the window, the display window. Um, It's kind of zooming in on the sign that says antique. Yeah. Like it almost feels Hallmark channel-y. Yeah. With that I first see shot, that. like it does not feel like a horror story. Also, again, there's pop music playing alongside this shot. Like yes. it doesn't seem scary. And of course, we know that this entire movie is covered with a soundtrack by the legendary artist Lisa Donnelly, and it's got all her pop hits in there, all yes. her top hits that we all know. Well, I mean, they're easy to know because it's basically the same line over yeah. and over and Something over. Something about getting a little devil. We all have a little devil in us. Yeah, we do. Or something like that. Yeah. So anyway, first shot, not scary. Then um, the first line comes a little bit later as a woman is entering this same antique shop. She says, what is always our favorite first line? Hello. Yes. Aunt Sully, what was the second line of this movie? Well, it's weird that you should ask. I was just curious. The second line is also... No. Yeah. And then that same woman, upon having nobody respond to her, and in retaliation for this terrible customer service, apparently, <laughs> um, she just takes a music box with a little gargoyle on top of it and steals it. Yeah. And that sort of set the tone, like, immediately this movie made me think of Gremlins, which mm. kind of makes sense all throughout, even to the point of putting the Gremlin in the microwave and microwaving it. Yeah. Less effective in Less this movie. Less effective. Which is surprising, given that they talked about the freaking microwave so many times. I know, and that was a good line when she repeated that after blowing it up in the microwave. I would but have really liked the work. movie to end right there. Cause, although my first thought was, that's a long way to go for that punchline. <laughs> yeah, it was. It also made me think of some movies. The whole, like small item that you bring into your house voluntarily which mm-hmm. then tries to kill you makes me think of i can never remember what the actual story is but the stephen king story with the monkey where yeah it's the little monkey with the you know with the with where the he, he yeah he like bangs the symbols together and every time he does that somebody dies but there's there's lots of movies like that where there's a, a thing that you're like, oh, I, I like this. This is cute. Yeah. I'm going to bring this in my house. And then it takes 90, how many, 97 minutes for you to figure out that that's the thing that's trying to kill you in your sleep. Yeah. Even though it's always something that looks creepy, like a little mm-hmm. monkey doll that claps symbols or a box with a gargoyle on it. Right? Everybody was like, oh, it's so cute. I'm like, nope, that thing is definitely <laughs> possessed. Okay, so I want to talk about something that I absolutely loved about this movie. Oh, goody. Like, like I think this is the most positive thing I've had to say about any of the movies we've watched all month. Wow. All right. Considering you have given a 4.5 to three different movies. Okay, now wait. I'm not talking about the whole movie. I know. I'm just there saying. There is a thing within the movie yes. that I want to give a 5 to separate from the movie. <laughs> all right. Is that a thing? No, but you can say something good about it. So, Kyle Gass. I forgot to mention that. Yes. Yes. Uh, His name was mentioned second. Right after Jack Black. In the credits. Not after Jack Black. He plays the role of Terry Lumley, one of her neighbors in this apartment building, um, who he's the first person that she meets there. He shows her around. He's just all around a good guy. Yes. And not in that, like, look, here's someone who's a good guy way. (laughs) Like, he just is a good guy. Like, he just acts like a normal person. And they have this friendship that's built because she doesn't know anyone. And he comes and, like, greets her and welcomes her and makes her feel like a human being. And it was amazing. Like, (laughs) I don't think I've seen a relationship or an interaction between two people all month long that was as realistic as the interactions between Terry and Jennifer. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of little specific reactions that were not so realistic, like the couple of times that he appeared behind her out of the blue in the middle of a room that she was in. <laughs> like was Yeah. No, I know. There were yeah. there were those things. But like just the way they interacted yeah. was so normal and it was just such like a 
here's a friendship that develops and it's an odd friendship so like he's in his 50s this girl looked like she was like 23 i'm gonna say she was probably more like 28 because her friend who showed up was referencing knowing her in high school and that was 10 years ago right. she did not look like she was 10 years out of high school <laughs> you know there was a significant age difference different genders whatever like it was just one of those unexpected friendships that happen in real life that so rarely happen in movies okay so you want to know the note i had about terry what it says terry making me nervous nice guy or serial killer the first thing i wrote about terry was i wrote i heart terry i'm gonna be sad when he's the killer (laughs) because we are so trained to think in horror movies that if somebody comes across and you're like oh he's just a really helpful nice guy you know he's gonna end up being the twist is he's the bad guy right well and it's also though like the way he does like he's this like old bald guy with glasses and preying on a young girl he's not preying on her but you know it's it's a little creepy this dynamic that's the thing though in movies that's always how it goes Uh in real life there are people like that like friendships like that happen people can be nice and as much as there was a part of me that was like oh they're gonna take this to a weird gross place (laughs) It didn't feel like they were going to. Like, the interactions, I was very comfortable. Now, there are lots of times where I'm watching these movies and I'm like, oh, no, hell no, that would not happen. (laughs) Um, That girl is not doing what that girl is doing because that's not how girls walk through the world. But in this situation, I believed that she would be friends with him because he played his role in a way that felt not dangerous. Like, he was Mm. not triggering all these red flags in me. Which was interesting. That's good. I, I really, really liked that. And I liked that they didn't twist him into being a bad guy. I liked that he was truly concerned about her. Like, yeah. he didn't automatically believe that there was some kind of weird thing that was biting her in the night. Like, Not at all. He thought she was on drugs, too, just like everyone else in the apartment complex. Yeah. But he still cared about her. He, he didn't, like, write her off. He didn't get weird about it he's just like i want to help you i was super sad when i thought that he had died and i was super glad (laughs) that he didn't i was too that was good also again speaking of the creep factor he showed up with this box that had the turtle in it he's giving her this big present of a turtle which first of all that's an iffy present you don't want to give somebody a turtle unless you know they want a turtle that's true and, but I feel like that's true about all living things. Well, when he gave it to her, I thought he had like found a package that was for her and he was going, this is for you, because it didn't make any sense that he'd be giving her this. And then, you know, later it was clear that he had. And I don't know, that was kind of weird and creepy. So Too much. the way that read to me is that he knew, because it, it was obvious that there was something up with her, right? Yes. Like that she was, she was a little twitchy. Like the times when he walked in and she jumped and, you know, overreacted, it, that felt okay to me. Like that worked mm-hmm. for me because of her background with, you know, this abusive relationship. Like I think she's somebody who's on high alert all the time. Yes. And he obviously saw that in her and could see that she was lonely and whatever and was, you know, giving, giving her, her something to love and connect with. And yeah, I mean, it's an odd... It's risky to go there, but it felt (laughs) natural to me. So there was Tina Turtle, which is the turtle Mm -hmm. he gave her. Mm -hmm. And then he also talked about Ike Turtle. And it was fun because in the credits, Ike Turtle was credited as nobody cares. Right. I actually wrote down that line as one of my favorite lines where he says... Tina ended up on top, you know. And Ike, nobody cares. Which was awesome because one of the other things I liked about Terry is he was legitimately not toxic in his masculinity and in his in his interactions with women like he just treated people like they were people whereas she had already by that time by the time that terry is saying these things and kind of trying to build up her self-esteem she's already interacted with two different women Mm -hmm. who had terrible terrible things to say like yeah like, the the cop lady who was like, there's two kinds of women. With those who cry about things and those who do something about it. Yeah. 
And I'm like, okay. I was real supportive of the woman who had just died. Who had just <laughs> killed herself yeah. because she was so traumatized by this thing that was happening to her. Like, wow. It was, I mean, yeah. You can either feel sorry for yourself or you can take action. I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And somehow the way she said it was so, so well, it was not dismissive. sensitive. No, yeah. insensitive. That is exactly the right word. And then she came across the, um, she was in that diner, and there's the waitress, waitress who happened to have her same name. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep, the waitress's name was Jenny, and she had just been at that interview where the guy said, so you're a waitress, in like <laughs> the worst tone. Mm -hmm. So she's talking to waitress Jenny, and waitress Jenny is like, oh, did you have a fight with your old man? Like... Well, the best way to fix that is to go home and make a mistake. And yeah. I'm like, your advice to this woman that you think has been abused by her husband is cook him some good food and everything will be fine? Yeah, Ugh. that was it. Also, she said when a uh, uh, main character, Jenny, said she didn't know how to cook, she's like, well, that's what microwaves are for. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're not going to cook a, a good steak in a microwave. <laughs> that's not going to go well, no. No. Terry also had one of my favorite lines mm -hmm. that I wrote down. He said, I have to do something proactive, okay? Yes. He was just so earnest. <laughs> yeah. I liked him so much. He wanted to be proactive. Now, there was also a man in this movie who wasn't great. That and is I have true. something to say about Boyd. Yes, tell us about Boyd. Uh, Boyd is her abusive husband. Ex-husband. So they did get a divorce. I think so, because she's gone back to her maiden name. Oh, yeah. That might have just been a thing, though. Could be. Anyway, she moved to get away from him, and he was abusive and horrible, and like they kept showing that. And all I could keep thinking was, this guy, Boyd, is less horrible of a person than Ronnie in our last movie. And yet they're doing the right thing portraying him in this movie as a villain saying this is it bad don't be like this instead of saying ah that's just ronnie it was a very distinct difference yeah i'm trying to think if i agree with you that he was less terrible than well ronnie because i think he like ronnie ronnie was building up to be a boyd because ronnie had not actually like he was he kept trying to do creepy things but I th oh. whereas I think Boyd has actually I mean Boyd actually bruised Jenny yeah. like he has actually abused her whereas I think Ronnie was just uh, mm. getting there he just really wanted to yeah I think the only reason he's never hurt anybody is he's never gotten the chance he is so yeah. scary he I mean he's a monster uh so is Boyd but for sure I mean the the, the key difference is not in which one's worse. The, the key difference is that they said, yes. here's a villain. Yes, I totally agree with that. They did make Boyd look terrible. Which makes sense. Yes. I I was so glad to see the, hap the, the funny part at the end of the credit. Well, in the middle yeah. of the credits. Yeah, there were multiple end scenes here. Yes, it was it was definitely a good thing. I always like payback for abusive <laughs> men yeah. in movies. Well, and I have a big social topic about that. Ooh, all right, bring it on. This is a big hitter. Okay. So, we have seen Marcus in Ride. We have seen Ronnie in You Can't Kill Stephen King. Mm -hmm. We've seen Boyd in this movie. And I'm not going to check the list, but I guarantee you there are three or four others in there that were about abused women. The Boy was about an abused woman. Yep. Very similar to this movie, actually. Actually, the way that they, like handed her over to, you know, the parents the handed boy. her over to the boy is very similar to, you know, it's along the same lines as Ronnie, like, I get to keep Nicole. Yeah. So there's all those things, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that stands out about that. So there are just thousands of movies about abused women. Like that's the core plot of any movie. You know, even if it's about something else, even if it's about a woman going on an adventure, it's in her backstory, she was raped, so that's why she's careful about this, or that's why she's tough about that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's okay. That's that's reality. That's a thing. But the fact that so many, most movies almost, are about abused women and this empowerment fantasy, 
which is what this movie was, was getting over it, getting through it. Hooray, you can watch that and feel good about yourself and overcoming things like this abuse. Mm -hmm. That says that our society has a huge problem, as we're seeing with the Supreme Court proceedings right now. We're recording this two weeks before you're hearing it, so I'm sure that's going to get me even Hmm. more angry in two weeks. Sure. And the Me Too stuff and everything else. We're seeing it all come out that every woman is abused in some way and it's just that's just the story that's just what we we know that so here's our story it seems to to be kind of accepted as our cultural norm which is exceptionally yeah. sad and then makes it that much more frustrating when the narrative around it is but sometimes people lie about it uh huh like, and what and a lot of the narrative today is not even that it's yeah but so what like is it that bad it is what it feels like and there's a ton of that out there and people just pushing back and and what's so messed up about it is we're about a hundred miles off of the cliff right now from normality and equality it's not that we're like right at a tipping point that we're like oh it's going a little too far or whatever Mm -hmm. and so people push back we're light years out there and it doesn't make any sense to push back it's like the stats is like at least one in four women have been sexually abused like not not harassed but abused and it when you add in you know just harassment and stuff like that it's like three and four or something it's everywhere it's everyone and most people want to just say eh what are you gonna do boys will be boys yeah i think it makes a lot of people uncomfortable to think about and to talk about yes both because it's hard to think about someone that you love or someone that you know experiencing something like that but also because a lot of times it means that you've been supportive of and friendly with someone who has done a terrible thing yeah and we gotta cross this we gotta move out of it and i think we're we're making progress now in the last couple of years in ways that have never happened before so things are changing rapidly but i, I totally agree with that it's a and mess. i think that a big part of that is uh well first of all women are starting to talk about the things that they've experienced i think that's huge and a lot of those things are things that they're things that make people feel isolated because they're shameful They make you feel guilty. They make you feel alone. They make you separate from people. And I think, um, I know for for all of my life, I have felt like women are, I mean, I've I've known a lot of very supportive women, but the cultural story around women and friendships is that we cut each other down. We're always competing. And I think part of that is that everyone, not everyone, I mean, we're doing a lot of like, hyperbole in in yeah, talking about this but but a lot of women ha- are carrying this thing that they think makes them separate and different and broken in a way that nobody else is and the more we talk about the things that have that the, you know the more we talk about those things that we're holding inside the more women are turning to each other and saying oh yeah turns <laughs> oh, out it's not just it's me it's all of us and then there's that thing where if it's just me then it's i just need to stuff it down and and like get over it but when it's happening to people i love then i'm going to fight And I think that's part of it is we're starting to realize it's not just something that I need to stuff down and get over. It's something that I need to fight because it's affecting not just me, but everybody that I love. And I think that's a huge piece of it. I also think a huge piece of it is that as we talk about it amongst ourselves, then we start talking about it in public settings. Like social media has become a great tool for, for women telling their stories. And as women speak out, there are men who are listening and hearing those stories. And even if they weren't truly cognizant of all of the things that were happening, because they would never, they could never imagine doing something like that to somebody. So they're like, it can't possibly be as bad as the movies make it seem, right? Right. Like that's all fiction. Yeah. And Or it's very rare. Right. Sure, some people get murdered and raped, but come on. Right. Those same men who would never have done it just didn't really weren't really aware are hearing these stories and are and are believing 
that they're true and realizing that they have been missing a big piece of the picture of mm -hmm. our country. And they too are starting to take a stand. And I think that combined energy is going to make a lot of difference. I really yeah. do. That's what I'm, that's my position. Like I, you know, I, I grew up not knowing that this stuff was going on. Like I know guys would cat call women on the streets and that it was super common, but mm -hmm. eh, whatever. They're just right. yelling things. What harm can it do? Even though when I picture something like that happening to me, not that specifically, but somebody on the street like yelling something at me, my heart explodes. Right. I, I can't handle that situation for a second, even if it has nothing to do with sexual issues. Right. And you don't have to worry that if you don't respond appropriately to that situation, that that guy might follow you down the street and physically harm you. Yeah. Well, just because I don't have to worry about it doesn't mean I don't worry about it. That's true. I'm good at worrying. That's true. So I think that your point about this happening a lot in the movies is interesting. and Yeah, and I'm not complaining that movies do it too much. I'm just saying, like, that's your sign right there. Like, it's in every movie. So you should realize that it's everywhere in our culture. Mm -hmm. And it always has been. Truthfully, I am complaining a little bit that they well, rely too yes. much. Yes. I mean, it's fairly rare to find a movie with a female protagonist where she's not driven in some way by sexual assault or sexual violence. Yeah, that's true. Um, which is kind of disturbing. Like, yeah. there are a lot of strong women out there who are strong for other reasons. Yeah, there could definitely be more of that in the world. Yeah. So so this took a very serious turn, but I think it's that's my favorite thing to talk about with with movies is what does it make you think of and what are the mm -hmm. serious themes and and i think that that idea of self-empowerment and confidence was the ultimate theme of this particular yeah. movie especially since you know this what was it called jedek couldn't be killed yeah like she couldn't defeat it she put it in the microwave <laughs> for a significant amount of time longer than you would cook a burrito and <laughs> and it came bursting out through the glass like this yeah. thing was unkillable but she was able to stop it by just flat out telling it look you don't get to win mm -hmm. so we need to come to some kind of agreement here i just you just gave me like a a mega metaphor thing here yeah like it would stop when she looked at it mm -hmm. when she confronted confronted it. it kept her eyes on it it would not hurt her anymore it was slowly eating away at her over time it was <gasps> tearing her down you know and like you said in the end <sighs> she was able to reach an agreement with it and send it after her man <laughs> yeah i mean that part of it the mm, that was good for the horror story but <laughs> the metaphor loses a little bit there yeah um but uh, you're absolutely right. Like, this was the story of her self-doubt and her pain and her, all of those things that she, yeah. all of those things that he had, wounds that he had inflicted on her through, through the abuse. Yeah. And she pulled out the hurricane bat. Yeah, she did. She went back to her true self. Oh my gosh. I love this movie. <laughs> I actually like it way more after this discussion myself. That was a, that was a breakthrough. We've had a breakthrough here today. <sighs> Well, so I mean, there's there's a lot that we could talk about, but I, I have think that lots more notes. I think that that was a really important conversation to have. So I'm ready to rate if you are. Ratings. Wow. Well, I haven't come up with a number yet, but that number is not going to be what it was going to be. <laughs> we've had a whole. We've internalized this movie. We've seen the art inside. The the wonderful tunes of Lisa Donnelly. <laughs> And to, to really, I mean, this was one of the first movies where we've, we haven't been like, I think they were trying to say something, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. Like I, we got I, there. I didn't, like, I totally got the empowerment at the end, mm -hmm. you know, but I didn't get the metaphor until you were talking and it suddenly heard it. And I was like, oh, 
There it is. <laughs> well, and it's pretty glaringly obvious. That yeah, makes me wonder how dumb we sneaky. are <laughs> and how many other movies the the poor writers and directors are going to be listening because you know everyone in the world is going to listen to this podcast. Well, at and least everyone in the world. Sometimes twice. Yeah. And they're going to be like, it's so obvious. Why don't you understand it? I know, and we're hating on their work mm. even though they're being deep. I feel yeah. bad. All right, so what are you rating this movie? <sighs> well, in our patented five point system. This makes it tricky because I don't think it was great. Like it's it's very low budgety and like I don't know. Uh, it looks you know it's rated TVMA. It looks like a TV movie. It's not mm-hmm. impressive, mm-hmm. and it just kind of felt I don't know like almost eighties in a way. Like it was it was weak is the word I want to say. Like mm-hmm. it was just kind of weak on all fronts. But there was that metaphor, and actually even before I figured that one out. The uh, the end of the movie really brought it up for me. Like I thought it was good from the trailer. I thought it was going to get stupid at the end where she's you know fighting the little flappy thing in her apartment, and it was stupid. But then it turned around where it got out of the microwave, and she just went. <laughs> oh, that was like her Wonder Woman moment. <laughs> it was, and you, that's even that is also stupid, but it's stupid in a great way. Mm-hmm. Like that was a really good moment. I had a thrill <laughs> in my heart when that happened. When she just grabbed it out of midair, I was just uh-huh. like, "Yeah." That was basically a superhero movie. Yep. So the end really brought it up, and now even more with the whole metaphor knowledge. So I guess I'm gonna give it four turtles out of five. Tina Turtles? No, Ike Turtles. Nobody cares about Ike Turtles. Mm, but he gave me this pamphlet. <laughs> That's one of my other favorite lines <laughs> in this movie. I totally agree with everything that you just said. It feels sort of weak. I'm sorry, Lisa Donnelly, that music <laughs> just does not appeal to me. It, it did not it fit the movie It did not way. fit the movie. The, the style was... Not the worst we've ever seen, for sure, but no. definitely not anything, like, groundbreaking. Mm-mm. I felt like the acting was pretty good. Yeah, I would actually did think so. I, I particularly liked the way um, both Terry and Jenny were acted, like, I, I they felt realistic. Yeah. Not just in their interactions between each other, but, like, just who they were. Felt like whole people. Some of the other characters felt a little stereotypical, but... Yeah. Almost in a funny way. But yeah, this story really appeals to me. And I am going to give it a 4.5 Woo. turtles out of 5. Mine are Tina turtles. <laughs> okay. Because I rate only in Ike power. turtles. Yeah, and the thing is, it's this, um, it's another sexual assault story. That's a good story to tell. Like, it's good, but there are too many of them. So, I don't know. It is good, but it's it, it comes down to representation because when the only women you get to see on TV are women who have been sexually assaulted. Yeah, that's not good. That's not that's not accurate. I mean, that's not it's not an uplifting representation, you yeah. know, and particularly with minority women. Like Yeah. On every TV show and every movie, the only representation they see of themselves are side characters or characters who have experienced extreme assault because they don't become important until that happens which is not a great message to be telling women and girls no it's not but this definitely was um trying it it did a good job surprisingly so surprisingly so and i wasn't really into it at first i was just like "Eh, this is not going great but the further it got in the more i was into it and by the end i was hooked it's actually very rare that a horror movie gets better as it goes yes, along. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> the endings are usually the weakest parts. Yep. So it was impressive that that was not the case here. All right, Hurricane Soli. All right. Let's blow this pop stand. <laughs> Check. Check, 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 check. Check. Check, 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 check.